Hey, we have been in this series on James, and uh, we're actually, this is our last one. We're going to take a little break for a couple weeks after this and do something different. Uh, so in the next couple weeks, we're going to be talking about what it means, this concept of uh, the, the series title will be Jesus for President. It's election season. Uh, we all wish we could vote for Jesus right now instead of the other options we got. Uh, that would be great. But uh, we're going to talk. We're going to talk a little bit about what it means to be a Christian and uh, how we deal with politics as believers. Uh, but right now we are in this series on James, and we're looking at a passage in James chapter two where it talks about faith and works. And it's kind of funny, actually. Uh, I got to preach on this passage this past summer at middle school camp. So some of you guys, if you were at middle school camp, some of this might sound familiar tonight. It's gonna be a lot of the same stuff, but I just ask you stick with me because it's still important. It's still something I think we need to be reminded of. But before I get into it tonight, let's pray. God, thank you for Elevate. Thank you for our church. Thank you for the friends that we have here, the family that we uh, gain through knowing you and your son. And uh, Lord, I, I just thank you for this time together to read your word and to grow closer together as a church family. Help us to learn what it means to live out our faith tonight. In your name we pray, amen. So right off the bat, uh, I kind of like to, t this story, it's kind of like a scary story. So it's Halloween season. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you this story, all right, since it's Halloween. Uh, it, it's, about, it's about clowns. Is everybody, nah, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Y'all know, is anybody else like, is anybody else like freaked out when you're outside alone in the dark? Like I keep, like last night, last night I had to take the trash out and I'm like, I'm looking up and down the street just expecting to see a clown with a machete. Like I am freaked out constantly right now. I hate clowns. Don't like them. All right. This story's not about clowns. It's, a, it's an old story uh, from the early 1900s, and it takes place in a prison. This prisoner, he had just got put into prison. Uh, he was, don't, middle school, I know you've probably heard it. Don't tell it. Don't ruin it, okay? This guy had just gotten put into prison. He was a young guy, and uh, he was going to be here. He knew he'd be here for the rest of his life. Uh, the things he had done, they had put, in, put him in there for a couple of life sentences. And, and so in this prison, just like nowadays, they typically give you some kind of job, some kind of work to do while you're in the prison. And this guy ended up getting stuck in the mortuary, helping the, the head mortician at the prison. So anytime somebody in the prison would die, this was the guy that had to deal with that, prepare the bodies. They'd put him in a coffin and they would send him out for whatever kind of funeral or service was being held. And so this young guy, he starts working with this mortician and, and they start to form kind of a, a friendship, a bond. This guy kind of, the mortician kind of looked at him like a son, you know? He just kind of saw him as somebody he just, you know, he knew he'd made some mistakes in life and he cared about this young guy. And they grew really close together over the next couple of years. And the longer this young guy was in prison, the more he started to think, I gotta get out of here. Like, I, I need to get out of here. I need to go live my life. And so he starts kind of having conversations about the life he'd like to live with this older guy and kind of telling him, man, if I could get out of here, these are the things I would do. I, I would do better. I would change my life. I, I would be different. And finally, after a while, this young guy, he kind of comes up with a plan, but he knows he can't do this plan on his own and he's gonna need help. And so he approaches the, the mortician and he tells him, this is what I'm thinking. I, you don't have to help me. I, I don't wanna put you at risk, but if you're willing, I, I've got a plan to get out of here. And the mortician, he, he listens to the plan and, and he, he says, let, let, let me think about it for a couple of days. I, I got to think this through and decide if it's something I really want to commit to. And, and so finally he says, after a couple days of thinking and, you know, just trying to figure out if it's the right thing to do, he decides he, he wants to help this young guy get out of here. And so he tells him, all right, let's go over the plan again. And, and so the young man tells him, here's what I'm going to do. I, I've seen everything, how it works here when somebody dies. I know the process. So I know 
that the next time somebody dies, they always ring a bell whenever someone dies in the prison. So I'll know when someone is dead. Then that night, there's a guard I know that will let me out late at night and he will let me get out for a couple of hours. I'll go down to where you prepare the bodies. And I know what you typically do. You put the bodies in the coffin and you shut it close. I'll get into the coffin with the body. They'll put me on the cart and buggy the next day and they'll take me out and they'll bury us under there. And then, then you'll come and you'll dig me up later that night and no one will ever know. And so this old guy, he kind of thinks about it and he's like, yeah, that that plan is foolproof. I mean, you're right, they'll, they'll have no idea. It'll be like you vanished into thin air. And so they agree to it. And a couple months pass. And finally, this young guy hears the bell ring and he knows someone has passed away. And, and so he makes sure to talk to the prison guard to make sure he's gonna let him out at night. And he, uh, late that night, he gets out of his cell and it's pitch black and he's walking through the halls and he gets to the mortuary and he's able to feel his way to the coffin and he's able to lift it up and he gets inside and he closes it on himself and the dead body that's in there. I know that's pretty gross. And he just waits till morning. And the next day they come in and they take the coffin and he can feel him carrying it along the halls and they put it onto the cart and the buggy and they go out and he feels the horse moving this thing for a couple of miles at least. And finally, he feels it stop and he hears men outside digging the hole and he feels the coffin being lifted and dropped in and he hears the dirt coming on top. Can you just imagine how claustrophobic that would be to be trapped in that tiny coffin knowing that there's six feet of dirt on top of you? And from there, it's a waiting game. He, he can tell about what time it is. It's about noon when he's in there under the ground and they're finished putting the dirt back on. And so he waits until nighttime and in his head, he's kind of keeping track of the hours and it gets to be past dark and he knows, okay, the mortician should be coming any minute now. And he waits and he waits and he starts thinking, well, maybe he just got delayed by something. And he waits and he waits. He's getting a little nervous at this point, but he still has faith in his friend and he knows he's gonna be coming for him. And so he waits a little bit longer. Finally, at this time, he's freaking out. The the claustrophobia is just killing him. He knows he just needs to look around and see just so he doesn't feel so sick to his stomach. He just needs to see something besides pitch blackness. You ever been in darkness that's so black It feels like you can feel it on your skin. That's how dark it felt for him in there. And so he had brought a little pack of matches with him and he pulled it out and he lit the match and he breathed a sigh of relief when he looked up and he could see. But then he turned his head and he saw the worst thing he could possibly see in the world. The dead body next to him was the mortician. Oh, yeah, I know, right? Oh, the plan is ruined. That guy got buried alive. Nobody was coming for him. That guy thought he had the perfect plan. He thought he was free. He thought he had his get out of jail free card written. Only to turn on the light and realize He was buried and he wasn't coming out. That is a lot of us when it comes to our faith. Look with me, James chapter two tonight. James chapter two, verse 14. Look what James says. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions, can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and well fed, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? 
So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Faith without action. Faith without good deeds. It's dead. There's so many of us in here. I know tonight because I, I've been there. There's times in my life where I can look back and I can know I've been there. Where, where I say I have faith, I believe it, I, I think it in my heart. I, I say, yeah, I got baptized, I gave my life to Jesus, I got faith, but I'm not living it out. And James warns us there, faith without deeds, faith without any kind of action is dead. Now, don't get me wrong. We are saved by grace. We don't have to do anything to earn that grace. But understand this. If you're not living out your faith, if it's not real to you enough that you want to live it out and honor Jesus by the way you live your life, your faith is dead. It's buried in a casket, and it's not coming out until you choose to come out. It's a choice to live out our faith. And so many of us today, we look at faith as a get out of jail free card. Uh, a lot of us, we went to middle school camp or CIY this, this last summer and you heard the gospel preached. You heard that Jesus saves, put your trust in him. And you said, yes, I want that. I wanna have faith. And you made that decision. But some of you, since you've gotten back, you've been dead in your faith. It's nothing but words to you. You're not living it out. You don't care about what it means to live for Christ and honor him. You don't care about what his word says. And you've been doing your own thing. You've been living your own way. And James is telling you tonight, that kind of faith is useless. You think you have this perfect plan you think you got it all figured out. You got your get out of jail free card. You got your get out of hell ticket punched. But James is saying, no, that's a lie. You might believe that, but really you are laying in a casket. You are dead in your faith. I had a couple friends one time and we go way back all the way to elementary school, Chuck and Graham. And there were two guys that still to this day, I, I constantly try to pray for and I, I want them to know Jesus someday. But not too long ago, well, actually it's been a while now, four or five years, we got together for lunch and we were having this conversation and I just kind of felt God prompting me, you need to have a conversation with these guys about me. These guys don't know me and they need to know me. And, and so I brought it up. And it was a hard, awkward thing to do, but it brought on some great conversation about what they believed. And I told them, I care about you guys. I want you guys to know Jesus. I don't want you guys to go to hell. I love you too much. And they, they kind of said this to me, almost exact quote here, but they said, we, we believe in God. What more is there? That, that's all we need. We believe in God, so we should go to heaven. And I brought up this verse because it always strikes me as something that's so common in our culture. It's a common belief to believe this. You say you have faith for you believe that there is one God, good for you, even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. How foolish, can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Even the, even the demons believe in one God. Just saying you believe, just saying you have faith, there's more to it than that. Real faith leads to action. When you really understand the love of Jesus and what he's done for us, the sacrifice he made, it moves you to love the way he loves. It moves you to action. Not to just sit back and coast through life, doing whatever you want, taking advantage of his grace. 
saying, well, I'm covered by grace, so I can do this, I can do this, I can do whatever I want. Yes, we're covered by grace. But should we go on sinning? No. Because Jesus has a better way for us to live. He wants us to live with faith and action working together. Don't just say you have faith. Live it out. Otherwise, that faith is useless. Verse 21, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God and counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Abraham and his wife, Sarah, they wanted kids for a long time. And God told them, I'm gonna give you kids someday. And it didn't happen for years and years until Sarah was 90 years old and Abraham was 100. And then they had their first kid, Isaac. That's old, guys. That's like, that's older than most of your grandparents. It's not scientifically possible, all right? Miracle kid. They finally get this kid, and there was nothing more valuable in that culture than having kids. That was like a sign that you were blessed. If you didn't have kids, it was a sign that God didn't love you. That's how people looked at it. They said, oh, you're cursed by God. And these people finally got this boy, Isaac. And then one day, God tells Abraham, I want you to sacrifice Isaac. I want you to put him on an altar and I want you to sacrifice him for me. Can you imagine that? God telling Abraham to give up the one thing in this world he loves more than anything or anyone else. And so Abraham says, all right. And he and his son go on this trek to Mount Moriah. And the son is carrying the firewood for the sacrifice on his back. Yeah. And so they're going on this trek and they get to the top of the mountain. And Abraham, he grabs some rocks to build an altar to the Lord. And he sets up the altar there. Then he starts to tie up his son and he lays him on the altar. Then he grabs the knife and he raises it above his son's head. And here's what happened. At that moment, The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld him from me, even your son, your only son. He laid his own son down on the altar for God. Faith and action working together. That's a hard thing to do. To lay your own son down on the altar. He was willing to do that for the Lord. Some of you guys in here tonight, he's asking you to lay something down on the altar to back up what you say. You say you have faith, but your faith faith without deeds is useless, it's dead. He's asking some of you tonight to lay something on the altar. Some of you guys know the way you've been living. You know you've been looking at things on the internet you shouldn't be looking at. You've been doing things with your boyfriend or girlfriend that you shouldn't be doing. 
the way you've been talking, the way you've been treating people, the things you're seeking after in this world. God's laying it on your heart tonight, something he wants you to put on the altar because he wants you to stop living for the world and start living for him. What's he asking you to lay down tonight? Are you willing to match your actions to what you say? Are you willing to live it out tonight? James 2, 25. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and she sent them safely away by a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. What's it look like for you tonight to live out the good works that Jesus is calling you to? What's it look like to lay something down on the altar for him tonight? Stop waiting and do it tonight. And for some of you in here, you may have never in your life made this decision, but you know tonight Jesus is calling you home. He's saying to you right now, you need me. Lay down your life because I'm worth living for. If you wanna do that tonight, come find me. Come find one of these youth leaders in the room. Let us know if you wanna give your life to Christ tonight because he's worth laying it all down for. He's worth living for. Lay it down and go live it out.